So the lesson I chose to do, and then I've got a series, a lesson series I'm going to start after October, uh, and, and it's, it's going to be a good break for me. I'm going to be able to do a lot of things in preparation while uh, John. But this is from the September Restoration Herald. How many read the cover article, uh, an, unbre an Unbreakable Chain? Yeah, well, I looked at that, I, read, I was reading that this week, and I said, wow. I said, there's my, because I've been looking for inspiration for a final lesson before we get into the restoration. And this, this kind of goes along with what we were talking about with Zwingli and baptism and doctrine. And it's also going to tie in with what the restoration movement stood for. So an unbreakable chain is a title. And, you know, basically, I'm just going to kind of read through some of my notes. And some of this is from the Restoration uh, Herald author. It's John, uh, or I'm sorry, it's Paul uh, Pinchot. I don't know that he has contributed a lot, but John said we're gonna hear more from him. So at one time, especially in our churches, the biblical plan of salvation was a settled matter. And as we studied in Zwingli, in Zwingli versus uh, you know, Baptist versus the Bible, basically, so the first 1500 years of the church, baptism, was an essential part of salvation. It was believed that's where salvation was bestowed. And so it was considered a settled matter, but the devil never gives up. And, you know, scripture teaches of Christ's redemptive, redemptive plan and the response a sinner should make and need to meet God's conditions to get forgiveness of sins and to give us the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Scripture tells us what we have to do. It's man that screws it up, okay? Uh, the Bible given plan is what well, I listed on the board there. It's faith, and that is belief in who Jesus Christ is. Repentance, what is repentance? A 180, turning your, turning your behavior around, okay? And following God's behavioral uh, <clears throat> standard. Uh, confession. And, you know, the only thing I wish at preachers in the past, and sometimes I say in confession, and if somebody who is ignorant of what we're referring to, they might think, well, they want me to get up and confess everything I've done in front of everyone. No, it's confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, okay? That's what it is. I wish sometimes they'd just say confession that Jesus is, is the Son of God, okay? And then baptism. Baptism is the point, as Mark Luther said, where salvation is uh, is bestowed okay so scripture is clear it's not cloudy on this all right belief in god's plan is apparently now open for negotiation yeah now you know um, and god has never changed his redemptive plan who changed it man and of course so he's right in there helping, okay? So, mainly the view that baptism, immersion of water, is not an essential part of the salvation plan. That's what's been tinkered with. And you know, Satan just needs to get people to leave one thing out. You know? And I've had people say, yeah, but God honors the heart. You know? Well, he honors obedience. You know, and that's what we have to understand. And we... You know, in, in all compassion, you have to say, but God expects obedience to what he's told us to do. Yes, sir. I'm and, sorry. And we're seeing more and more the twisting of scripture in oh, yeah. context. I mean, even now in this abortion thing, you're seeing signs where they're actually trying to oh, make yeah. the connection with scripture. Yeah. Did you read my notes? Is that, <laughs> no, that, and that's part of what we're going we're to talk about this morning. Absolutely. So, and why, and, and right here it is, um, the first point, core contextual study of scripture is the reason this is happening. And contextual study, knowing what's being addressed, who's saying it, and what it's part of, what part of the discussion is. You can pull, Satan pulls scripture out of context to tempt our Lord. And Jesus is the word, so he wrote it. So he just refuted it. Satan half with scripture. Yeah, that's how you refute Satan. That's ultimately how you refute false teachings. And 
them. You know, scripture, here you go, Jim, is often twisted or spun to fit false ideas and to sometimes tickle ears. Who said that? Scripture, uh, who said? Paul said that to Timothy. Yeah, because, and I never understood, you know, it, was, it wasn't until I was, I've been teaching for about 10 years and I read that, you know, I read that scripture in depth. I thought, because I never could understand how can somebody read Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. You know, the great commission, which we're going to do, uh, we're going to read today. How can people read that and not understand? That means baptism is important. And then when I read Paul's uh, uh, words to Timothy, well, that explained it all. You know, he called it uh, tickle their itchy ears. People gather, they'll, they'll attend church. Or they'll listen to people who tell them what they want to hear. Um, easy gospel is what I call it. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. That's right. And today, and, and I think the worst offenders are the, the mega churches, but they're not the only ones. The message is watered down. They don't want to challenge anybody scripturally. Oh, no, you know, they want to make people. God is love. Yeah, God loves us, but he's also just God, and he expects and demands certain things uh, for salvation. We can't water that down, and that's a problem even in our churches today. You know, uh, we, we're not, you know, uh, there's almost this fear of, well, I don't want to be too much hellfire and brimstone. You know, sometimes we need to put people on the spot and, and scare them, okay? And as a child, I knew two things. I wanted to go to heaven, and I didn't want to go to hell. You know? yeah. and, uh, and, you know, I was baptized at nine and a half. We're going to have three three kids baptized today. That's what the plan is. And, you know, they're anywhere from uh, from eight to ten. And But they've been well taught, and they understand, as I did, you know, talking to uh, Steve Lahan when I was 20. I said, look, I didn't know everything. I was nine and a half. He said, well, did you know why you were being baptized? I said, because that's what Jesus wanted me to do. He said, you were being obedient. He said, you were always going to sin. He said, but he forgave you. So, okay, David first. Well, remember when Saul was playing battle and he... I wasn't around. <laughs> no, go ahead. Uh, and he was waiting on uh, Samuel to show up, uh, you know, you know, offer the sacrifice before the Lord. And he, he laid some Peter himself. Yeah. And Samuel said, what have you done? Well, I thought, what I thought was right. Yeah, but he said that God requires obedience. And the Lord left me that day. Yeah. So, That's right. Immediately. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're under the new covenant, the new covenant, which is like a will. When the will is written and the will is read and somebody is left out of the will that's in the family, can they change that will? Yeah, no, only the original yeah, giver. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's a great lead-in to my next question for the class. What book is the only divine revelation in existence to be studied carefully in context? God's holy word in the Bible. And that is, he is the will giver, if you will. Jesus was the will giver in the New Testament. And we can't change what he gave. Excellent point. Uh, and remember, exact words matter in studying God's word. And from time to time, I'll put the Greek up here from the translation a couple of times the Hebrew. Uh, it's important, and as I marvel, especially within the last couple of years, at Jack Cogrell's answer to what I think sometimes is main questions, but they're questions people have about scripture or things being taught. You know, and hearing Jack speak at some of the symposiums, he goes to the, he goes to the Greek all the time. He says, this is what the words are. This is how they're getting it wrong. They're misinterpreting. You know, and actually sometimes he can tell you the Greek word that would have been there to fit what they're saying, but this is the Greek word they used. You know, so words matter, and the translation you use matters as well. Um, <clears throat> so, it is important and a great review always to know what the Bible says 
about baptism, because baptism is what we're talking about today, that flashpoint, if you will. And Tony Sullivan, in one of the last couple of uh, issues, he's one of their columnists, and he's also a CRA trustee. Uh, in his article, he talked about how preaching baptism, you know, and he'll do a revival, and he'll preach a couple sermons on baptism, and he has had people challenge him, say, wait, most of the people here are, are Christian. Why are you preaching on baptism? We know about baptism. And his reply is, well, you never know whether everybody a revival or any preaching opportunity, there should be visitors there. You never know if there's someone who has never heard about, you know, about the plan of salvation, the full plan of salvation and baptism. And he said on more than one occasion, there's somebody came that even surprised the local church that's come forward to be baptized. And it's like, well, we didn't know. And so his point was, you never know. By the way, I didn't get a chance, but um, there was a, another article, I can't remember which one, I think it's in this magazine, or the August, where a preacher, um, I forget who was, I think it was Jim Book was, was writing an article about using scripture, and using scripture, making that a focal point. That's Tony Sullivan, he's giving, he's giving uh, my 10 suggestions for uh, new preachers. And he said, use the scripture and use it heavily in your sermons. And he said, he had an email from a preacher who said, uh, who does that. He said, the elders in his church actually approached him and were critical. And they said, we think you're using too much scripture in your sermons. Oh. And I went, what? Yeah. It was unbelievable. You know, and apparently it's making some people uncomfortable. But you know what? God's not here for our personal comfort. He's here you know, we need God more than he needs us. So anyway, so let's move on here. So <laughs> baptism is a necessity for salvation. We've been studying that um, out of years here lately. All scripture is held together by an unbreakable chain of divine authority. And that was the whole theme of this lesson, this uh, article. Okay, there's an unbreakable chain of divine authority for what the scripture says. Because there's some... And Satan does it, and there's some uh, religious groups today that call themselves Christian, but they question the validity of the Bible, okay, and the authority of the Bible. Link by link in this chain of divine authority, we have a solid defense of everything God says about his plan, of, uh, his plan for saving sinners. So we're going to look at eight links in this lesson in the chain that validates the New Testament teaching about baptism's importance and receiving salvation in Christ, okay? Link number one, God is the creator and the truth giver. Now, we all know Genesis 1-1. What does that say? <laughs> okay, so God is the creator. Psalms 24-1. The earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Okay, the earth belongs to God, is what that says. So God is the creator, and he's the truth giver. God is the first link in this chain. He is the all-powerful, all-knowing, and everywhere present creator. Okay, I kind of put in some more broader words than what some of the fancy language is in there, but that's basically what he said. He's everywhere. He's present everywhere. He is the creator. God, because he created everything, is the ultimate final authority over all things. There's no other authority. Not Dr. So-and-so, compiled <clears throat> high and deep you know, degree. Uh, no, you know, God is the ultimate final authority. God is in charge. Despite what some want to believe differently. You know, and people who resist Christianity, they want to be able to do their own thing. We see that. That's rampant in our, in our culture. We see Christians falling away. Uh, our young people, you know, sometimes they get... Uh, twisted teachings to them when they leave, when they grow up, when they get into college, or even when they get around other people in the world and work and they fall away. But God is in charge. God alone is qualified alone to set all standards of right and wrong. You know, not Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer, you know, or these, uh, or these uh, pro-abortion groups. Okay, not the judges. God is the 
God is the alone giver of all standards. God not is not just our God is not just our absolute authority, but He is the truth giver. Okay, God's word and what He reveals is and will be always true. Okay, we can't doubt one scripture out of that Bible. You can't take it away. This is my thought. God is never wrong. You agree? Amen. My second thought, God is never murky, is he? Amen. There's no, nothing wishy-washy about his plan of redemption for man. And, and the love that people want to pray, <laughs> the love is that God gave us a redemptive plan. He didn't have to. He could have just started over. Think about that. They didn't want to. And the reason he delays coming back, according to Paul, is so that more people will have the opportunity to spend eternity with him. So, <clears throat> therefore, if he's never wrong, he's never murky, what God has said about his plan of redemption and its conditions is the only way he bestows it on mankind. You know, God didn't leave it up to theological discussion, especially when it comes to baptism. <laughs> The Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16. Yeah. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. That is Paul writing to Timothy. All Scripture, before and after his writing this, uh, is God-breathed, God-given. Okay, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And spoke from God. Those that gave us our Scripture were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's God's words. What did Jesus say in John 17, 17? That's you. Go ahead. Yeah. Sanctify them through thy truth. The word is truth. Okay. God's word is truth. Thank you. So, God is the creator and he is the truth giver. All right. Link number two in our chain. Jesus came for what purpose? Yeah. To bring salvation. That's right. John 1, 1 through 5, and then verse 14. First John. No, John. John the Gospel. The Gospel of John 1, okay. 1 through 5, and then verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and life was the personal light of man. And the light shineth in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. And then 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as our only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so this is John talking about Jesus. Jesus uh, has always been, and he will. He is part of God. He is God, and God came in flesh. Through Jesus Christ, as Jesus Christ. God, Jesus is the eternal pre existing word sent from God. Okay, that's what John is, is driving at. Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. He is the perfect God man. Okay, Jesus accomplished redemption by his death, burial, and resurrection. Matthew 28 18. Then Jesus came and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Okay, so Jesus, in verse 18, was given authority over all things. Who was he given that authority by? God the Father, okay? So Jesus had authority over everything, right? That is his 
Uh, that is his pedigree, if you will. Okay, that is that qualifies him. Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks to you and remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and the glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparable, comparably great power for us who believe. <clears throat> that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present, present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Okay, Jesus has headship here. That's what Paul is writing to the Ephesians. Jesus is over all, and God appointed him to be over all. Jesus is over the church, and I just, I almost now get indigestion when I hear them refer to the Pope as, you know, as God's representative here on earth. God's representative was Jesus Christ, okay? No, nobody else. And people confess sins to the Pope, we're not instructed that that is not scriptural. We confess our sins directly to God through whom? Jesus Christ. That's right. Not through Pope whoever. So uh, Jesus has headship. He is over all things uh, now that he has resurrected and is back at the right hand of God. All right. Jesus, his writings on baptism. John 3, 5, which I didn't put up here. Uh, this is when he was talking to Nicodemus. He said, a man must what? Be born again. Be born again. And Nicodemus said, how can a guy go back into the, in the womb? He said, no, he needs to be born of watering of the spirit. That's baptism. Spirit comes at baptism. In Matthew 28, 19, that, that Don just read, it's part of the Great Commission. Go in all, all the world. You know, baptize them. All right, Mark 16, 16. Who's got that? I do. Okay. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. Okay, so you got to believe. The baptism is linked there. It's not whoever believes and then is later baptized. That is what it's saying. Belief and baptism is part of the plan of salvation. All right? And if Jesus commanded baptism, and he did, even when he went to be baptized himself, and John, and uh, John did not want to baptize him. He said, I need to be baptized by you. What was Jesus' reply? It is necessary to fulfill the scripture. Jesus didn't have any sin. He didn't have to be baptized, but he underwent baptism as an example. To set an example. He was the son of God. And he was showing how important that is. He wasn't saying, you got to believe. you got to say a sinner's prayer. It's not in the scriptures. All right? So if Jesus commanded baptism. How can any man contort this command for baptism? You know, man has no right. Link number three, Jesus called the apostles. All right? And uh, in Matthew 4 and in Mark 3, and we're not going to read it, Jesus called and appointed his apostles. And the word apostle means, is another translated word, means sent forth. And it was used with the idea back in Jesus' day, ambassadors. And ambassadors represented who? Well, God or the divine authority. The authority, you know, in secular terms, that represented the king or whoever was in charge of that of the government. All right, our ambassador today to England represents the United States and our political class, the ruling class, if you will, to other countries. All right, and so Jesus called and appointed his apostles, 
And they were to become special ambassadors for Jesus with Jesus' message, his commands, and Jesus' instructions to the church. Jesus had the authority to appoint the, the apostles. All right? Um, who's got John 20, 21 through 23? Did I put that up there? No. Okay, I did. All right. But basically, the, the apostles, the 12, they were, yeah, they were given special authority from Jesus. You know, this is on the night before he uh, uh, was betrayed. Okay, they're given special authority from Jesus. They're promised the Holy Spirit. Yes. Link number four in our chain, Jesus gave the keys to the kingdom to whom? Upon his confession. Gave it to Peter. When Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, because Jesus asked, who are people, you know, who are, who are people saying I am? They're all different. You know, I judge, I'm Baptist. So who do you think they say I am? You know, and, and, and Peter's one said, well, you're the Christ. You're the son of God. And so Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom to Peter. Peter received special delegated authority from Jesus for starting the church. Okay, did I give anybody uh, Matthew 16, 13 through 20? Yes. Okay, go ahead. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some said John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Well, what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this is not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. What else do I do? Okay, keep going. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. <clears throat> Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Okay, so Peter had the right answer to Jesus' question, and Peter gave him the keys, the authority, to the kingdom. Okay, he gave him special authoritative privilege regarding the gospel and establishing Christ's church. Okay, not man's church, it's Christ's church. I think that's where some, some, some worshiping groups out here, they forget. This is their church. It's Christ's church. And, you know, he gave him the keys to the kingdom. And I have a thought just now. It's like a power of attorney. I've got mom's power of attorney. You know, to direct her financial affairs. I have her medical power of attorney. You know, they weren't going to ship her up to Miami Valley Hospital and drill on her head like they wanted to. I said, nah, that ain't going to happen. And they started, yeah. And I said, I don't even want to talk to your surgeon. You know, we're not doing that. Okay, I had mom's authority delegated to me to make decisions for her, and Peter had Christ's power of attorney when it came to spiritual things. That's a good way to, to think of it. All right. So uh, again, uh, regarding the gospel and establishing Christ's church, Peter had the authority. Link number five: Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to his apostles. Did I give anybody Ephesians two four? It's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Okay, so all the apostles became Holy Spirit inspired spokesmen in that first century. Okay, built on Jesus. Jesus was the cornerstone. And Jesus had made the apostle the, the, the promise in John uh, previously to all the apostles. And that was in John 14 through 16. And when he's meeting with them before he is, he is taken. And what was the role of the Holy Spirit that was promised for the apostles? So they could be, they could remember all that was taught. That's right. And have remembrance and also have the divine gift. That's right. And the word translated for the Holy Spirit in, th in these scriptures is paraclete. Paraclete literally translated as a word giver. The Holy Spirit was going to be a word giver to the apostles. Okay. So, you know, the Holy Spirit was an advocate of Christ. Therefore, he was an advocate of God to teach the apostles all things from Christ. Okay, that was the seal. That was the guarantee of what they were teaching was Christ's truth. Their message and their instructions, the apostles, the one who wrote our, our Bible, their message and instructions were Christ's. 
instructions. And we have to understand that we can't, we can't argue with that. You know, argue to the wall, but don't argue with Jesus. Yeah. So again, uh, Jesus in John 17, 17, he asked God, and we had read that earlier, to sanctify the apostles and God's truth. And sanctify means separate them. Separate them from what the world teaches and, and have them only in God's truth. That was Jesus' prayer. Link number six was Jesus' commissions to the disciples. And again, we know the Great Commission of Mark 16, 16, uh, also Matthew 28, 19, and 20 uh, through 20. Jesus' Great Commission included baptism, making disciples, but making disciples was linked with baptism in his, his thing. And each one baptism is directly connected to salvation. And this isn't just stated by the apostles. This is stated by Jesus Christ. The apostles just followed up. All their writings and teachings, every example of salvation in the book of Acts, which is a history of the beginning of the church, every example includes baptism. And I had a Baptist guy one time say, well, you can't use Acts for, for the doctrinal things. I said, why not? Yeah. We use the Federalist Papers to know what the true intent was, the original intent of our, our Constitution was, that's history. History tells us what they did, and what they did was baptize, you know, no matter how you want to try and spin it. And so, uh, again, uh, stated by Jesus Christ, baptism is concurrent with making disciples, as mentioned in, in Matthew. So who distorted Christ's plan? Satan. Okay. Satan, and he influenced men. Yeah, Swing so you know, uh, Zwingli's a swinging, I think. But, you know. So, salvation is given by God when belief is there and when the believer submits to baptism. That's where salvation comes. Okay, and so many in the Christian world, again, all I said earlier, all Satan's got to do is turn one or, one, one or two things around. There's so many things that salvation is given uh, in belief, and baptism is totally different. Baptism to them has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with being circumcised spiritually or something. We read about that. Okay. <clears throat> so, salvation is given by God when belief is there and when the believer submits to baptism. Link number seven. The apostles were told to be Jesus' witness to the world. And they were because they were eyewitnesses to Jesus' ministry. And they were eyewitnesses to his death his burial, burial, and his resurrection. So that's one of the links. They were a link between Jesus and the world after Jesus. Yes? Did you say something? Uh, Acts 1 8 says, But you will receive power from the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There you go. And that was Jesus' words. Okay, link number eight, the final link. Jesus started his church. Scott. Um, one thing too is, remember when they replaced Judas, the the qualifying factor was they had to be a uh, Jesus follower follower from his baptism to to, to his the resurrection. Yes, That's right. Good point. So Jesus started his church. Acts two thirty seven and thirty eight. I don't need to read that. We all know that the message of Christ convicted. You know, many of the Jews there and many submitted to his salvation command here. And the command was, repent, be baptized in Acts 2.42. They said, what do we need to do to be saved? I don't know how you, I don't know how you misunderstand. Repent, be baptized. In other words, change. You know, they already believed because they knew they had killed the Son of God. They already believed. But that didn't save them. Well, what do we got to do to be saved? know how they can be saved, which means they repented. That's right. So, you know, this proves the plan of salvation was settled at the very beginning of Christ's church. You know, it didn't come along later. It was at the very first sermon. You know, it was there. There was no altars, no sinner's prayer, just repentance and baptism after they believed. Okay? And these conditions of salvation became the norm for all, even after Pentecost. After Pentecost. Okay, and then you have Cornelius. After he believed, he and his, he and his household were baptized, and on and on. So to conclude, God established his unbreakable chain of authority regarding God's plan of redemption. It's God's. It isn't man's. 
We can see God's absolute authority through Christ delegated to his apostles and preached and written to the church. God's chain applies to everything taught in the New Testament, including baptism. Yeah, there's nothing that you can take out, and there are people who try to, out of context, leave things out. You can't do that. If God said it, then it's settled once and for all. It's not open to debate. Okay? And if God said it, it is settled once for all. Final question if anything else is taught, who are they arguing with? God, that's right. You know, argue with God. This is what he put in the scripture. Maybe he'll change it for you. Okay, any questions or comments? All right. Next five weeks, John Mitchell preaching some very excellent material or teaching some excellent materials in here on the restoration. Sorry. I mixed them. You timed out. Number five was Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to his apostles. And if there's any others you need, you can find it right here.